afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us on another Barometer Readings webcast. Joining me today is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President here at Barometer. On today's webcast, we will speak to the market volatility. I'm sure that everyone has felt it over the last week and a half. And of course, Dave uh, and I will be pleased to address your questions at the tail end of this conversation. So don't be shy. Email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the chat on the Zoom link. And with that, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. David, good afternoon. Okay, folks. Well, thanks very much for joining us. Um, it's uh, obviously been an interesting, uh, interesting week. Uh, tough week for tech investors, a uh, tough, tough week for, for lots of different types of investors, uh, and certainly one where it's been important to be targeted. It's been important to have a good selling strategy. And what I thought we'd do today is just take a run from the top, as we normally do, uh, and then talk a little bit about what happened to sort of the key leadership themes this week, uh, what was particularly weak, uh, what, what may be pulled back within trend, uh, and talk a little bit about what's changed in our positioning. We are an active manager. Our job is to make changes as markets go through changes. Uh, and certainly this was one of those ones where we were pretty focused on the portfolios over the course of the week. Um, just to start from a backdrop, you know, we are tactical managers. We do pick our spots. Uh, we try to make sure that we've got the market tailwind behind us in whatever asset classes we're focused in. We have had a belief that we're in a structural bull market that started in 2013. Uh, and structural bull markets can go on a, a very long time. Um, like for instance, 1982 through 2000, uh, or certainly 2013 through the present, we're just about 10 years in. If we take a long-term picture of the, of the market, this is the S&P, structural bull markets do have corrections. They tend to come in either time or in price, chopping sideways uh, or pulling back in price. If you look at the current pullback that we're in, it's been going on a few months now, uh, really started in December for the S&P 500, uh, October, November for the NASDAQ 100, and for the small technology stocks, February of last year. But this is within the context of a bull market. You do have uh, certain sharp corrections along the way. From a rates perspective, we've been at the view that we saw a generational low back in 2020, at the lows where the, the US Treasury bond was at 36 basis points, it certainly moved higher from there. Uh, and when we look at uh, what's happened to yields, this is the very long-term picture. You can see that in the last month, the 10-year yield broke up and through the very long-term moving average that marked this bear market in yields or bull market in bonds. We said a couple of weeks ago, when we get up and through a long-term moving average that's declining very often, at some point you get a pause and you can see yields have pulled back a little bit from that 3% level they got to about a week ago. Well, we closed today around 2.77%. Um, so yields moving higher. This is, the, this is the yields themselves in the shorter term from 2000, November 2020 through the present. One leg a consolidation, the second leg higher. We probably hit our near-term target or somewhere close. Uh, yields pulled back a little bit this week. And it's important to look at that because one of the things that we know is that um, one of the things that we know is that uh, stock markets hate um, uh, quickly moving yields. So um, certainly they've had an impact on stocks over the last short while. Uh, when we look at mortgage rates, which are obviously important uh, to the economy, you can see that the prevailing 30 year uh, mortgage rate has had a few pops along the way through this bear market. You had a very sharp move in 1994. And that, that, that set up a correction in the market that went on over the course of the year where the market basically bounced sideways. It did pose a headwind for the economy and the concern was that it would cause a recession. But we've had very sharp move higher in mortgage rates. This does probably pose a challenge to the housing industry. One of the reasons why housing stocks perhaps have pulled back the way that they have but certainly something to keep in mind from a real economy standpoint. So when we look at the bond market, the aggregate uh, bond market, uh, the aggregate ETF AGG has pulled back about 17% from the highs 
going back uh, to, again, August of 2020. We had a little bounce this week. Uh, and so, so that means yields came down a little. When we look at the TLT, the long end of the U.S. bond market, uh, off the highs, down 34%. That's a very significant move. From the beginning of the year, 21%. That's a tough move for bond investors. Certainly has not been a place that we wanted to focus from an investment standpoint. And this has been a very large short position in our macro fund over the last 18 months. We covered this short about 10 days ago and no longer are short any of the various bond maturities. Our view is that probably in the short run, the, the bond bear market has run its course. Ultimately, that can become supportive of stocks if we have just a little bit of a calming in bond markets that can help settle investors, but we'll have to see. This is the uh, iGov, which is the government bond ETF for international treasury bonds. You can see down 22% off the highs. It's not showing signs of reversing at this point, uh, but our guess is the long-term trend for bonds around the world is lower in price and higher in yields. So this makes this asset class very difficult to invest in. The yields that we're receiving as an investor are very low relative to the risk that we take on that rates go higher. So no real focus in the bond market. Let's talk about commodities. Commodities has been an asset class that we've had a belief made a significant structural generational turn back in 2021. We've broke the trend line of, with the, the downtrend that have been in place since 2008. And you can see we've marched higher month by month. And even this month higher, even though we pulled back a little bit off the highs, this has been a very consistent marked move higher and commodities relative to stocks continue to outperform. When we look at the subgroups, this is the RJI ETF, which is made, a, made up of an unweighted basket of uh, commodities. And you can see the relative price has been rising steadily versus the S&P 500. When we look at the oil ETF, the USO, same thing, rising relative strength, certainly pulled back a little bit into the moving averages this week, but energy continuing higher. This is gasoline prices, same thing, trading above long-term moving averages. This is the agriculture ETF, RJA, which includes a number of grains and oil seeds. Uh, made a new relative high versus the S&P this week. Did pull back a little bit into the 50-day moving average. But again, all of the moving averages, nicely smooth, higher. This is a very clear, defined uptrend. So just take a look at corn. You know, this is, this is a, a, a wonderful chart. We had a consolidation, a handle formed, <clears throat> broke out to the upside and not showing any sign of abating. So whether we're looking at energy, whether we're looking at uh, agriculture, or frankly, whether we're looking at base metals, the trend is higher. This is the 200 day moving average. And again, this week, the base metals pulled back some in price, but does really nothing to break long-term trend. And this DBB ETF made up of base metals, individual metals, uh, trading stronger than 90% of the companies in the S&P 500. Even gold, with its pullback this week, again, continues to look very constructive. So materials continue to act well. Commodities continue to outperform stocks. A very clear uptrend it doesn't mean it's immune from pulling back along the way. Now let's look at the S&P. This is the S&P 500 chart going back to November of 2020. We know that the market has chopped over the last few months. These were the lows that we made in uh, January, sorry, uh, January, uh, February, and March. We've pulled back to just above those lows, again, testing those lows. It will be very important to see whether the S&P can hang in above these previous lows. Now, the big problem for the S&P continues to be technology. We get some very important earnings results tonight, and it's gonna be important to watch. As we know, the NASDAQ has underperformed the S&P. You can see the relative price strength versus the S&P going back to November. It's now pulled back pretty sharply off the highs, more than 20%. Uh, and I believe today we did close below the lows going back to March. So this could be an important level. I would not want to have a large technology weight at this point. 
It may just test the lows and rally, but my guess is probably these continue to go lower. But the NAS large NASDAQ stocks make up a big part of the S&P and again are challenging for the S&P index. The NASDAQ momentum has been weak for 13 consecutive months. And if we go back over time, the only times we were exceeded was the bear market in NASDAQ stocks after the year 2000, where you had 15 months of negative momentum. In 1982, 83 bear market, where you had 19 months of negative momentum. So we don't know when we're there. We don't know when they will turn. We're not gonna try and guess. We don't pick bottoms, but the net of it is, this has been a group that's been important to avoid. Certainly even more so unprofitable tech. This is the ARKK ETF. Again, today made new closing highs down five and a half percent. Okay, let's get to this week's data. We said last week, the important thing that we would be watching for this week was earnings. We are into an important time period. Last week, the S&P was buffeted by concerns of rising rates. There were several Fed speakers who came out and talked about the fact that perhaps rates might have to go up more quickly and in larger increments than previously expected, and certainly that spooked the market. Now we get the next Fed meeting next week, and we are going to get a rate increase. And as of the end of last week, the Fed speakers are done until that next Fed meeting. So now they go into their quiet period. So the market's going to focus on earnings. Now, in the period leading up to earnings, we don't tend to have a lot of corporate news. They tend to go into a quiet period as well. Tonight, we get some important tech earnings. We know that coming into the earnings period, consensus estimates have gone down a lot less than they typically do in the first quarter. Now we have to see where the rubber hits the road. When we look at what the numbers have been so far, of 100, 100 of 500 companies have reported, the average company's beaten the earnings est the, the revenue estimate by 1%, and they've beaten the earnings estimate by 7.2%. But you can see, even for companies that were reporting beats, it's been a mixed bag. The market has not been rewarding companies that have been beating estimates. So this is something that we're watching very closely. Now, at the end of the day, we make our decisions based on process a set of rules that help us to make a consistent decision time after time. And certainly they're not all gonna be ready, but this process is aimed at limiting our mistakes. Of course, we start with a broad-based universe of stocks, 60,000 securities that we look at, and we run them through a series of tests at the company level to try to buy, identify companies that are good getting better. There's about 20 metrics that we look for in the income and the balance sheet and price behavior that would support a positive view. So if the fundamental data is getting better, but price performance is weak, this makes it a security that we can't invest in. We run this process daily. We drill down to a list of companies that we would call our farm team, things that we'd like to own. But the problem is you can buy a great company at the wrong time and get your tail handed to you because you're in the wrong part of the market. And so we know that 80% of the return in a portfolio comes from getting to the right asset class, which is why we start every one of these calls with a discussion of fixed income, commodities, equities. Often we'll wind up talking about real estate. We want to identify asset classes that have a tailwind. Within those asset classes, we want to find sectors or themes that have something changing for the better. 80% of return comes from getting to the right neighborhood. Then 20% of return is finding the right security. So of course we spend a lot of time trying to find the securities to build our portfolios, but most important, we want to understand, we want to understand which areas of the market we should focus in. So let's just talk a little bit about that top-down decision making because it's really relevant in this market. Our basic belief is that there are a thousand things that impact markets. We know there are problems with COVID in China. We know there is a war going on in the Ukraine. We know there is significant inflation across a number of different types of assets and, and goods that we use every day. We know there are lots of issues out there in the marketplace, but there's also lots of positives. And ultimately, the combination of those thousand factors generate a response from investors. And we know certain types of responses are very positive and certain types of responses are negative. We know that over the course of a cycle, 
when we go through a decline, the weakest securities sell off first. And as time goes by, stronger and stronger securities get impacted until late in an event, a decline, many of even the strongest companies get impacted in the end. Now, when the, when the market starts to turn, the weakest securities don't turn higher first. When people want to put in money to work in a difficult time, they want to buy the things they have the highest degree of confidence in. So very often while the market continues to weaken, the strongest securities will quietly turn higher. Now you're not reading about those, you're reading about the weak overall market. Now I can point to certain parts of the market that are behaving very effectively right now, but there's a lot of the market that behaving very poorly and that's the news of the day. If enough securities or groups turn higher, sentiment starts to shift. And as you go through a bull market, one by one, securities join a rally. In other words, when the breadth of the advance is expanding, it's healthy. Now, at some point, there's a new problem. And the things close to the problem sell off first. And as time goes by, the other securities start to get impacted. And when you wind up in a broad-based decline, one by one, securities sell off. There's no bull market in history that ever ended before you saw deterioration in breadth. And there's no bear market in history that ever took place while breadth was expanding. When breadth starts to deteriorate, that's an important signal for us. It means that no matter how strong your securities, they could be vulnerable if things get bad enough. And it means that we have to be really vigilant with our selling strategy when breadth starts to deteriorate. When breadth starts to weaken, we'll raise some cash in the portfolios will tighten up the stop losses that we use on every security to protect against making sure a little mistake doesn't turn into a big one. And then to the extent new money comes in or we've got money sitting on the sidelines, we hold it there in cash until we start to see breadth improve. Now I run these models every day. I run them across each major market. I run them against every major industry group. We only wanna focus on groups that are seeing improvement in breadth. So here's what our models look like this week. Last week, we highlighted the fact that the NYSE bullish percent or the percent of stocks and uptrends in the NYSE had turned down. We also highlighted that our short-term indicators, percent of stocks above the 50-day for Canada, percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average in the US and globally also turned down. The percentage of stocks with positive weekly momentum, we give every security a single vote, what percent have positive weekly momentum? and that was deteriorating. Same thing for the number of stocks hitting new highs versus new lows. And the same thing for the percent of stocks trading above their 150 day moving average. So as we sit here today, our breadth models are negative. Through the course of last week, we tightened up the stop losses on all of our positions. Now, just because something pulls back in price doesn't mean it's breaking down technically. Things pull back naturally but our tools try to help us identify inflection points where the odds of success go from being in our favor to out of our favor. Now we know that it's been a difficult year for investors and the percent of days where there was more than a 1% move has been very elevated versus other years. Going back the last time we had this many 1% moves at this point in the year was 19, sorry, 2010 and 2009. So we sit up and take notice of these things. We know the percentage of stocks in uptrends globally was improving through the early part of this year, but since the beginning of April started to back off. That made us more concerned about global stocks. When we look at the percent of stocks in uptrends in the US, we put in a low in January, we rallied through February, it pulled back to a higher low in February rallied through March and is now pulling back in April. So that causes us some concern for US equities. The Canadian market, actually, the breadth model has remained very firm. And that might have something to do with the fact that the Canadian market is highly positively correlated to inflation because of our weighting in materials and energy and forest products. The Canadian market pulled back to the 200 day moving average and has been significantly outperforming the S&P 500 since the beginning of the year. 
that helps explain why we have 65% of our equity exposure in the Canadian market, even though it makes up such a small percent of the overall global market. When we look at it, we know that if we look at the S&P, the dividend yield in the S&P is about 1.3%. The dividend yield on the TSX 60, well over two. We know that earnings correlation to CPI is about 40%, where earnings correlation to the S&P's earnings to, to, uh, to CPI is only about 25%. So let's talk a little bit about leadership themes and what may be happening in the groups that we're focusing in. As most people know, our large weight has been over the last number of months, energy. This is the Canadian capped energy index. This is relative strength versus the S&P. And we close today almost at a new high in relative strength versus the S&P 500 doesn't mean it didn't pull back over the course of the last week to just above the 50 day moving average. A very strong uptrend in place, even in a difficult market. If we look at a point and figure chart, what we wanna see is higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows. And we've seen that in an orderly fashion going all the way back to the beginning of the rally in the middle of 2020. Should we break these lows, it would cause us to get more cautious in individual securities, should they start to underperform the energy sector, they're gonna get cut back. And in fact, we had a small amount of our Canadian equity exposure that got cut back in the last week. US uh, oil and gas companies, again, strong relative price performance versus the S&P. In fact, the XOP ETF is trading stronger than 97% of all the companies in the S&P in the last year. But we certainly pulled back. 9.1% over the last five days. That's not insignificant, but we remain in a very clear uptrend and very strong versus a market that's correcting. Materials as a whole, this would include base metals, agriculture, <clears throat> uh, uh, precious metals, and, and chemicals. Very strong relative performance versus the S&P, but in the last week pulled back 7.4%, but sitting comfortably along above long-term moving averages, comfortably in an uptrend. Check. Looking at the subgroups, agricultural businesses, uh, firmly above long-term moving averages, trading better than 80%, 87% of the companies in the S&P. And again, very orderly series of higher lows. And certainly we don't like to see things pull back, but it's natural. And this is something that is continuing in a strong uptrend. There's the, the same ETF looking at a very long-term view, 2008 through 2020's bear market for commodities, breaking out and on a monthly basis, slowly working its way higher. And again, this month trading with a higher low than last month, trading with a higher low than the month before. We remain in a long-term and early stage bull market. Metals, this is the Metals and Mining ETF, XME, pulled back over the course of the last week, again, comfortably above long-term moving averages, doesn't mean there hasn't been some damage. It doesn't mean that we haven't pulled back on a few positions over the course of the week. We'll talk about that in a moment. Again, looking at the long-term price trend, same thing, broke out, consolidated. This has pulled back over the last two weeks. Again, very natural, something that we should expect to see happen. And this is the steel ETF, very similar. So these groups, in our mind, continue to be in structural bull markets. They certainly pulled back over the last week. We certainly have evaluated each of the underlying positions and we have cut some exposure back, but it's important to look at the big picture to say, is the theme intact? Let's move beyond materials. Within industrials, we talked over the last few weeks about aerospace and defense, again, pulled back into the 200 day moving average this week. Again, strongly outperforming the S&P 500 since the beginning of the week the year and actually we're very close to making new relative high versus the s p for the year check residential reits actually made a new relative strength high versus the s p this year down a little over the course of the week but in a strong uptrend dividend leaders as a whole look there have been two key themes in place since this reflation trade started one of them has been dividend growth companies that have a natural ability to pay a sustainable dividend and grow it steadily. The FDL ETF pays a yield over 3% and has been able to grow their dividend over 15% over the last three years. 
Today, it closed at a new relative high versus the S&P. No weakness there. The materials and energy clearly pulled back over the last week, but again, clearly in uptrends, clearly outperforming the market. Consumer staples and utilities both continued to perform well, both making relative highs versus the market. So I think that these themes are clearly intact. Now let's take a look at the stuff that is not working. ARKK, innovative tech, continues to make new lows. Technology as a whole, if we look at the XLK, this is large cap tech, today closed at a new low for the year. We think this opens up additional vulnerability below here, which is why we are short certain technology positions in our long short portfolio and in our macro portfolio. One position, which took a group that we used to really like, semiconductors, and turned it into a short position, XSD ETF, making new lows. We broke all of these lows over the last uh, three days, opening up a window lower. This is the software group, down 32% in the last 120 days. This was a group that we held for many years leading up to uh, the, the rotation out in November and December. Industrials as a whole, outside of the aerospace and defense sector remaining weak. Certainly robotics and automation is a group that's down sharply over the course of the year, trading only better than 28% of the companies in the S&P. <clears throat> Consumer discretionary has been very weak since November. Uh, and, and communications, which frankly includes Twitter, which got taken out yesterday at a premium. The CTF down from 86 to $60. So we think this continues to be a market of haves and have nots. We think there are risks at the market level, which is why we have an elevated cash position. We think that we have to look at each individual security and make sure that our stops are in place. Outside of the US, emerging markets as a whole have been a very weak place to be since February when, when the innovative tech companies rolled over. The EEM down from 58 to 42 over now over a year. When we look to aggregate this, we can see that the largest number of relative new highs versus the market come in the group's utilities, consumer staples, and real estate. That's dividend. Oh. Hopefully you can hear me. There we go. The groups that with the fewer number, fewest number of relative new highs, communications, technology, financials, and industrials have been relatively underperforming. So we don't have to be everywhere. We've got a target leadership. Let's talk about the portfolios. Our largest weight continues to be energy at 25% of the portfolio, down only about 2% over the course of the week. Cash is now our second largest weight at 12.36%. That's across all portfolios in the firm. But at the same time, our short-term bond position is now up to 10%. So we would say that the average portfolio is probably closer to 15% in cash and cash equivalents. But there have been some important areas taken down over the course of the week. Materials, we, not because we think they're broken, but because they are higher volatility, have been taken down from 23% to 11%. We'll look to reweight those on a, on a turn for the better in the market. Staples are up a little over the week to just about 10%. Industrials continue to be a strong group at 6.8%, just a little bit below market weight. Utilities are twice market weight. And on the other side, communication services, excuse me, communication services, financials, real estate, technology, consumer discretionary, and healthcare all are way below market weight. So we look very unlike the market and we are vigilant with our stops. Should this market continue to weaken, you'll continue to see our exposures come down. In our macro portfolio, again, we took our exposures down quite dramatically, and we continue to like the groups that we've been focused in over time, but we just think it's a time to have less exposure. You'll also note we took off our short position in fixed income, which we think probably has run its course in the near term, and bumped up our shorts in financials and technology. Look, there's a lot of things that people are concerned about, but there's a few positives, and let's wrap with those. First of all, sentiment now is lower than it has been. The fewer, no, fewest number of bulls 
going back to 1992. So the problems that are in the market are not unforeseen. We don't have a lot of investors who are overexposed or out over their skis. Investors have been pulling in their horns for weeks. So the sentiment is very weak. That's a positive. We don't like to see when people are overly bullish. In fact, when people are overly bearish, it tends to mean that we are at or near short-term market lows. We know that there's been lots of elevated um, uh, volatility. And as a result, we've got a lot of people buying puts. This is the put call ratio. As of Friday, the spike in put buying or people trying to hedge their portfolio matched what we saw early in 2022 at this market low, uh, late in November. We know that when put call, put buying spikes, it tends to mean we're getting close to a near-term low. Doesn't mean we're there yet. There's a number of positives. Bond yields that have moved very quickly are pulling back. Positioning in general in the market is light. There's cash on the sidelines. Sentiment is the worst since 1992. Put call volumes spiked on Friday. We're getting to a getting to what, to what looks like it could be an inflection point. The Fed is now in its quiet period. We know they're going to raise rates and we know surprises from them. Commodity prices have pulled back a little bit, which takes a little bit of pressure off the inflation story. The yield curve has steepened. The VIX, even though it moved higher, has not moved anywhere near where it was in January, February, and March market lows. And volumes are not exploding, meaning that selling has not moved into some kind of crescendo state. Look, investing is a step-by-step -step process. We're going to have corrections. It's important to keep in mind that technology has actually been correcting since February of last year. So if corrections are a combination of time and price, we've had a lot of time already. And often late in the decline, the leaders correct and pull back, which is what we've seen over the last two weeks. So look, if things get worse, I said to you every time on these videos, we get more defensive. I'm proud of where things sit. Our equity portfolios down 2%. S&P's down 14 and the NASDAQ's down over 20. Our income portfolio, our income fund is down 2%. Our balance fund is down 0.9 of 1%. And our macro portfolio is positive on the year. I think we're in a pretty good spot. We're not going to take any risks. Our number one job is not to lose the money. We thank you all for having confidence in us. And uh, we take our job seriously. So with that, Pam, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Dave. So we do have a question here from Eric. He wants to know how does barometer factor in the anticipated gains in the Canadian energy sector during upcoming earnings and tightening your stops in a down market where you stopped out of any energy names specifically? Okay, so just if I can just go back to the chart on exposures, I think last week we were something like 27% energy <clears throat> and we're 25% today. So no, we really have not been stopped out of really anything in the energy energy space. We did take our exposure down in materials because they're a little bit more volatile. It doesn't mean that we're not bullish. We're just trying to reduce the volatility in portfolios in the near term. We can certainly put positions back on as we see breadth start to improve. Dave, I'm gonna look up, there's one other question here that's coming from Quebec. I just need to pull it up here, so bear with me. Okay, this is coming from Stephanie, Stefan in Quebec. Um, David, uh, this email here, it says, um, when the indices were down, at least I had energy and materials to offset the losses, but now I notice that almost everything is going down. Does that signal a recession or what does that change mean to you? So you've covered a lot of that in our, our conversation already, but um, maybe yeah. you can elaborate a little bit more. Look, when, when, you, get, when you get later on in a decline, uh, the sellers look for things that they can sell. So very often the last things to get hit are the strongest groups in the market. And they often then may be the first groups to turn higher. We'll have to see. 
um, frankly, pulling back a few percent doesn't mean that they're broken. By nature, techno, sorry, by nature, energy and materials companies are more volatile than, say, utilities uh, or, or real estate investment trusts, which are more yield vehicles. Um, I, I do think that it is painful to see those pull back, but the structural picture behind them is much more bullish than the broken groups we've spoken about as we've gone through this call. So the risks as we see them aren't that technology all of a sudden turns around and takes off and that the strong groups all of a sudden show weakness. The risk is that technology continues to weaken and that the strong groups could get dragged down with them. And that's what we're watching and that's why we have stops. But at this point, I can't make that case. We've taken some, uh, some exposure down on a discretionary basis just to reduce our risk. Uh, and now we'll continue to monitor uh, position by position. Dave, this question comes from Yasher. He's asking, what material sector are you bullish or at least confident about at this time? I think that we're most confident uh, in the energy sector because there is a structural issue in the marketplace. Uh, yes, if China slows down, that can pull back a little bit of demand. But we are facing, you know, a shortage due to this Ukraine-Russia a situation, and it's not impossible that we could see a full embargo on Russian oil. That would be move energy prices sharply higher. Agriculture is the other area where there's just a structural shortage. So uh, the grain markets look very attractive, and farmers will be flush with cash this year. They will spend money on equipment uh, and fertilizer. So those would be the two that we are probably most confident in. However, long-term, things like nickel and copper are, again, in a structural deficit. You can't fix that by raising interest rates. And it's going to take years to build the capacities needed for EVs. So really, we're confident across that group. But in the near term, in a more volatile market, we got to be a little bit more careful with risk. This is one of my favorite questions, Dave. This comes from Lance. David, do you anticipate a sell in May and go away from the market? It's, it, listen, you know, you always look at seasonality. I think if I had to compare what we're seeing so far this year to any other year, I would compare it to 1994. Because in 1994, the economy came out of recession in 1991. It was running hot by the beginning of 94. Interest rates were low. The Fed realized they were behind the curve and signaled they were going to move rates sharply higher. And the market sold off into April, around now. Well, then what happened next was the market got ahead of it and the market took off and rallied back to the highs. Late in the summer that year, Paul Volcker decided that they were again behind the curve, said that they were going to rate rates further, and the market sold off again into year end. While the year ended almost flat for the index, the average company was down 30% or more at some point during the year. There was tremendous internal rotation. So I think we could be getting nearer to a near-term bottom in the market. I'm not saying though that it's gonna turn around and take off. It may be that the market will chop a little bit as we go through this rate hike cycle. And I think it might be uneven in the way it treats different groups. So we just have to put one foot in front of the other uh, and, and uh, try to not be out over our skis and make sure that we, uh, we follow our models. Thanks so much, David. Well, that concludes the questions. Oh, one second, let's see. David, would you, sorry, we've got one, one last question. Would you be able to comment on oil and gas services sector? Yeah, we think that the oil and gas services sector is probably going to be a pretty good place to be. Again, it's a higher volatility group, uh, but the XES oil services ETF continues to look attractive. The OIH uh, oil services ETF continues to look attractive. We own uh, precision drilling. Uh, we also own... Um, 
a couple of other smaller companies in our long short portfolio. So uh, we think that this is a place that we want to have exposure. We haven't been convinced that uh, something is changing there yet. You can see by our exposures, they continue to be pretty strong. And uh, we'll see what the next few weeks brings. Thanks, David. That totally concludes the questions that we've received this afternoon. And with that, uh, thank you so much for an ever insightful overview, Dave. And I'll leave you with the final word. Now, Pam, do you know if Jeff Spidel logged in? He Can did log him? in. Are you expecting him to come on as a panelist? Yeah, I just thought maybe I'd, I'd ask Jeff to just come on and give us a really quick update on okay. uh, what was happening. Oh, he's not on. I see. Okay, well, we'll have to. You know what? He's week. he is logged in to the part to the participant side okay. of the call, but we could we could get him on the call if you want him on a. Um, I'll tell you what. We'll bring him on next week. Um, okay. I think that what we can see is that the market is reacting well to things that pay yield, pay a, pay a cash flow. Um, uh, this music fund that we've been working on has been really quite exciting. Uh, we've had some great developments over the last few weeks. Maybe we'll spend, uh, we'll send a notification out. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about it next week uh, because it's certainly playing out to do exactly what it was supposed to do, which was to mitigate some risk, uh, to be a low volatility investment in the portfolios. Uh, and uh, the cash flow that it's generating has been really quite attractive. So uh, we'll ask him to join us again next week. I want to thank everybody for taking the time for joining us this week. Uh, and um, look, uh, have your wits about you. Uh, don't assume that because tech stocks are down, they're, they're going to turn around and go higher. They may underperform for a while. Uh, just uh, pick your spots. Thanks, Pam. Of course, David. Thanks, have everyone. a great evening.